And now, Alec, over to you. You have a couple of minutes. Go. All right, so this is going to be uh, chaotic. And part of that's because it's going to be chaotic anyway. But we're going to make it more chaotic by bringing up each of the sprint groups to have, I was going to say, two to three minutes. Now it's going to be about 45 seconds each. So uh, here's the sprint. What we did is basically we got uh, people together who had some uh, interest in working on projects and some skills to contribute. We stuck them in a room and uh, it's kind of a microcosm of how we do things around the PKP community. We have people with too much work, not much time, a lot of pressure, maybe not the, the people they need necessarily, but the people they have, and we put it uh, to work. Um, I feel a bit like we've just uh, given you a sausage meal and now we're going to take a, a little tour of the sausage factory. Um, which is not, there's no good order to do that in, but uh, here we are anyway. This is how we make the sausages. This is how you write the software. Uh, the rules for a sprint are there is no homework. Um, this, that was a rule that I maybe didn't articulate well enough at the start because now we have homework. But you shouldn't bring any homework home from you when you're finished. Uh, everyone's welcome, so we have coders, non-coders, people interested in uh, everything from design to documentation to actually getting down and writing some interesting code. Um, and you bring your own projects, BYOP. So you come in, uh, at the start we'll set up the, the groups based on who's present, what they want to work on, and we'll get to it. So after uh, a day and a half, um, we went through a number of different projects. Uh, if the sprint participants who have slides on this could make their way forward, I will start with mine and we'll see who else uh, has to say a few words. Yes, don't be shy. Come on up. <laughs> okay, so uh, one thing we did is we had a request from the forum, that's our user community, for um, a way to make a metadata field required, not just available, but required. Um, and that request will often make its way into uh, a GitHub issue, which is where the coders will do their work. Um, as you can see, we've created a GitHub issue and we've linked back to the forum so that somebody who's asked for this can say, oh, well, there's, there's something here that's now specifying in more technical detail what's involved. Um, we added a new column to one of the setup forms to flag a field as required, so your language, your rights, your source, whatever you have. Uh, and finally, we hooked it into the system so that now when you submit uh, an article or when you edit metadata, it checks those requirements. Um, we then went back to the forum and said, hey, it's here. Uh, you'll note it says at the very top in very gray letters, six months later. So we don't always get to it as fast as we would like. But that's a really typical example of how a request from the community turns into a bit of work, turns into a feature that's added, makes it into the software, and then gets back to the user in the first place. Book sprint. All right, so we had a very big group with, for us, and we were really focused on updating a document that's called Getting Found, Staying Found. This was first released in 2006. It was written by uh, Kevin Stronach. And it's a, really a guidance document around some of the best practices for uh, open access journals. So what we wanted to do is look at the document, pull out different sections, and update them. So. Here are just some of the sections that we wanted to, to do. So, and uh, we had people converge on these specific sections. So we did things like ORCID, encryption, security, um, the PKP index, uh, dealing with library union catalogs. Um, so there was a lot of content produced and a lot of uh, came out of that too. So where we're going from here is to pull all this information together and revise the new document and to align it with uh, the documentation roadmap that another group is going to tell us about because some of it may or may not fit within this document and uh, we had a lot of uh, great participation and uh, thanks to all the people who uh, allowed us to exploit their intellect. Hey, um, so I was part of a, a small group of folks who were focused predominantly on the issue of sort of documentation um, and the architecture of our documentation and sort of optimizing it for usability, which actually ended up sort of being a conversation about all the things that are wrong with our documentation in general. Um, uh, chiefly among them, the, I think the whole onus was that there was some documentation in the wiki, there was some documentation in Gitbook, it wasn't really clear what was where. Uh, so Jana and Janet uh, did an amazing job um, sort of combing through the wiki and seeing where all the contents were redundant. So we have sort of an actionable item and maybe before we sort of uh, uh, bury the wiki, at least update in the wiki to point out, you know, which sort of software stack that, that information is relevant to and give people kind of a sense of, of what documentation is currently deprecated so we know which parts of the wiki are useful or not to migrate to another platform. Um, we've had a lot of conversations internally about using Gitbook. We started using it two years ago to Sprint. Actually, Marco and I were part of a team that tried to get that going uh, and Gitbook has had a lot of issues so we were talking about where we want to put that material. So uh, today, actually Alex, uh, Kevin, uh, and myself 
itself um, did sort of a quick run through an environmental scan of other places to host documentation. I think the likely location is read the docs. That's my homework, I believe. Um, uh, and then we inventoried uh, uh, what was, uh, you know, sort of things that we immediately wanted to put in. And the, and the best part is we got a huge amount of recommendations on how we might want to uh, describe that information. So we have a problem where we call everything documentation, but maybe it's better to call things below three pages a guide, something b above that a documentation or a document. So we can have people find what they're looking for a little bit easier. Usually, as we all know, you used to look for something and you'd see something entitled OJS in an hour, and it was really OJS in uh, the summation of the rest of your life. Life. And so this way, <laughs> this way you needed something a little bit more expedient. You just needed a guide on how to, you know, help users do something. Um, maybe these guides would be a better way to go. So there's actually a shocking amount of homework, but uh, the team did uh, a ton of great work in sort of providing us all of the information we needed to do that intelligently. Mm -hmm. That was earlier than I expected it to be. So some of you may have noticed that there are some elite hacksores out there who have taken the opportunity to upload profile pictures of themselves saying, I hacked OJS, which is roughly the equivalent of me if Alec is collecting name tags, handing my name tag to him, writing some profanity on the back of it and saying, I broke your arm. But it annoys people anyway. <laughs> so. We fell back to one of the requests that some journal managers at Pitt have been asking for for a while, unrelated to this, was the ability to mediate accounts, to approve a new user on the system before the, system, the user can use the system. So we implemented that in 2x and a untested pull request in 3x, and you'll see that in 2.4.9 and 3.2. Hi, my name is Ilyas. So we've been working around the open data systems that might appear or get developed in the next years. Uh, the main issues we have uh, from our field is that people keep doing experiments and other people keep doing the same experiments because the experimental data is not available um, from materials and mechanics fields. Uh, we also have another issue is that experimental data itself is not valued uh, as often as a publication. But basically, the experimental data's purpose is to write a publication. After that, the experimental data gets lost. No one knows where it is, and we keep looking for it, never finding it. So we just redo the same experiment. Uh, so there are currently several initiatives that are showing up. We were able to discover them through this uh, workshop. It was really interesting to exchange with different people about these different initiatives that are trying to uh, be data repositories at the Canadian federal level or also f in some universities, for example. Uh, but the, the data sets still don't have any kind of value even if we store them. So we thought it would be interesting to make them citable so that they can be as valued as a publication. Um, so the way to implement this would be to fork OGS OMP uh, to create ODS and open data systems uh, that would help us go through the review and evaluation process of a data set until it's actually citable and we can get uh, clean metadata for it. Uh, so in the next uh, slide, uh, is it this one? We're just showing what we kind of built, which is the review, ideal review process for uh, data, and that would be per field. So in our field, mechanics and materials, it would look like this, and we'd have an OGS for our field, but then it would be necessary to develop other OGSs for, uh, ODSs, sorry, open data systems for each field uh, that would ensure that the metadata necessary to share that data and make it usable by others will be available uh, through that review process. Um, so yeah, the review process will be done in two parts. Internal one just to check the data format, file formats, to be able to build the metadata out of it and make it usable by others. Uh, while the other side will be the external uh, review just to check the quality and the content if it's actually understandable. After that, uh, this set with its metadata could then be shared in one of the repositories I was talking about at the beginning, uh, one of the federal initiatives. Was I able to talk faster than you? No. Okay, so our group was respons responsible for coming up with some solutions for internal workflow statistics, because I don't know if some of you have noticed, but uh, the internal statistics, not the ones that are about downloads or accesses, uh, but those that are about the editorial workflow. 
uh, itself uh, have some maybe strange uh, numbers pulling out sometimes. Uh, so we figure out, uh, well, the, the goals were to identify uh, desirable statistics for uh, to be reported from journals, uh, improve the journal level statistics, uh, providing more options uh, other than we, uh, what we already have, and identify statistics that are not being uh, produced correctly. Uh, so the solution we came up was to improve, first we would have improved some of the uh, CSV files that are uh, reports, you can then uh, import to Excel. And we also came up with uh, the a dashboard kind of thing that would show some of the most uh, important uh, data statistics, uh, sort of in at a glance uh, fashion. Uh, with maybe some graphics uh, on the fly, updated on the fly. Um, and so for implement implementation, we made a list of required fields for those statistics and um, filters as well. So we've, we've added some more filters and date ranges. Um, we sorted out by priority of development. Uh, so which ones would like to go first and, uh, and so on. We also did a benchmark with uh, OGS2 taking into account what it already has uh, out of the box, so we would just add the ones that uh, there isn't yet. And we also were able to identify some of uh, a long-standing issue that was causing some wrong data being pulled uh, from reports on OGS2. So this is mostly uh, documentation level. We didn't do any coding yet because the group was primarily uh, non-technical people, but uh, it's a good start. Uh, so my group is pretty small, just two of us, Demetrius and myself. Um, I've been working with Demetrius uh, for a better part of a year, and this was kind of cool because it was the first time we've met in person, so that was interesting. Um, the specific problem we want to solve is converting the export XML that you get out of OJS2 into a form that can be imported into OJS3. And the specific use case uh, we have is that we have uh, over 500 journals in the PKP uh, p private locks network now that have uh, have OJS2 XML, and we are anticipating having to take them out and make them publicly readable again into an OJS3 instance sometime in the near future or maybe 15 years from now, we don't know for sure. There could be other uh, use cases for this kind of conversion as well. Um, we didn't get as far as we wanted to, uh, but we, the solution we're working on is we want a script to make it completely automatic. Uh, we, you import some OJS2 XML into an OJS2 instance, you then upgrade that instance to OGS3 and you export the XML as XML as OGS3 XML. It's kind of a roundabout way of doing it, but we think it's uh, got some legs and we're going to pursue it after the conference. Hi. So, one of the new and exciting feature coming to coming with the next release of OGS is the REST API. So basically, this feature will um, allow scripts or uh, peop people to interact with OGS system without going through the user interface. So in order for programs to be able to query OGS, they need to identify first. So in, uh, uh, instead of having our own authentication uh, stuff, we, we deci decided to comply with uh, a, an open specification, which is JSON Web Token, and this integration was successful. So that part is ready. Then, and we, we know that OGS is made of plugins, so uh, in order for the plugins to, to take advantage of the REST API, we had to discuss about the ability for plugins to be able to extend uh, via hooks, so with uh, Nate, I was able to to talk to discuss a reliable architecture to prevent plugin conflicts. So development for that has started this morning, and finally, uh, Dulip, which is also was was part of our group, was it has worked on a document to outline requirements for OMP API.
So uh, this is, uh, I didn't really make a pitch for this, but this is something I already started before. Uh, there was a need for um, editors to be able to kind of uh, customize or personalize rather their uh, journals and a lot of the default themes are like kind of uh, not really distinguishable. So I think there was a need uh, for new themes. So right now I'm working on six themes. And during the sprint, uh, I had the chance to speak to people who were actually working on OJS3. So I had some more specific questions. Alex showed me around um, around the code, but there was no code then. It was mostly like um, making mockups. And uh, I worked a bit with John as well. Um, so yeah, pretty much right now, I, I so far I've made a, a theme for the health uh, health science based journal. Uh, the idea is to make themes based on academic uh, areas of research. Um, so yeah, I'm getting feedback. Uh, I have the I have the uh, prototype online as well, so anyone can comment on it and check it out. That'd be really cool, actually, and helpful to get points of view from different people. Uh, and the second part, actually, on which we John and I spent the most time was uh, <laughs> just kind of reworking the logo um, <laughs> to the bottom of it. And I think that was something that was a, a source of. Uh, Conflict, maybe not conflict, but uh, <laughs> so yeah. So we just did that, and yeah. So some eye candy, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So I can't underscore the size of the brain trust we had in that room, and uh, being as we do work remotely, uh, we never had the chance to meet each other, never, let, never much less the committee members and the community at large. So it's a really rare opportunity for us to get some interesting work done and figure out what everyone's like as a person as well, not just as a screen name. Um, watch the PKP blog, the link is here, for some detailed reports that will provide some more details on everything that we accomplished and some links to results and that sort of thing. So you'll be able to find out more if you're interested and see what legs each one of these sub-projects has. Um, and finally, please consider joining us next time. We have roles for techies, non-techies, everyone. If you, you won't necessarily be able to bring a specification and have somebody write it. But if you're interested in getting your, your knuckles dirty, um, then that's a really great way to do it. We try to hold them in spring and fall, generally speaking. Although this year, I think we're only doing one issue, one uh, event. So consider watching for the next event to be announced on the blog, PKP blog, and coming out. I'm the last.